Hi everyone. Um, I hope you had fun in the in the programming. Uh, now time for some some more abstract things than tensor indices, uh, contraction, and so. Um, so um, I'll be talking a bit about uh, how uh, we can go further than the equivariants that we've seen so far. Um, how there are more greater realms of useful concepts uh, lying uh, underneath. Um, and uh, use some uh, generalized notions of groups uh, to categories, uh, generalized group representations to functors, generalized equivariants to natural transformations, and what kind of useful things you can do with those. So, um, why do we use equivariants? Uh, well, um, symmetry transformation, uh, we use equivariants whenever we have things that are similar whenever we have some equivalence between objects. And um, we um, want, uh, we build networks uh, because we have some sort of equivalence or something where that is that we have to choose arbitrarily um, to represent our data for a model, um, but that doesn't essentially uh, make a difference so that whenever we process data um, with symmetries, we want our, um, our networks to respect those. Um, and symmetry groups are, um, they have two um, kind of uh, defining features. Um, they are invertible, um, any transformation we can go back from, and they're composable in that uh, when we do uh, two things, uh, when we apply two symmetries to an object, we um, get another symmetry. And um, um, we can generalize these concepts and uh, get um, richer things. So when we uh, lose invertibility, um, we get um, uh, categories, uh, and when we um, also allow for for arrows between two diff between different objects, we go from groupoids from groups to groupoids. And um, um, and the ideas that bring you equivariance um, also bring us um, uh, also allow us uh, to similarly have some math. Uh, instruct us how to build our neural networks, and those will be natural transformations. And I'm going to sk sketch a couple of things of how these can be applied and what kind of uh, networks we can build, but I feel that there's a whole wealth of things uh, that we can still do uh, if we just uh, uh, think a bit harder about it with a larger group of people. Um, and um, even by the people who uh, came up with categories and natural transformations and all of these concepts in the 50s, um, Eilenberg and McLean, uh, even they, they already thought that uh, a key role for categories is in the generalization of groupoids, uh, of groups to uh, more, more uh, general categories of maps. And um, so in a way, it's only obvious that uh, this is a, a way where we uh, continue the exploration in uh, geometric deep learning. So um, I'll, do, I'll redo a couple of introduction things that uh, we did on, on Monday, and I hope you don't mind. So uh, categories, they consist uh, of objects. Um, you should think of those as, uh, as abstract uh, things that we can map between, and the mappings are called arrows or maps or morphisms. And a um, key uh, property is um, that um, we uh, can compose these arrows uh, whenever um, one arrow points to a thing and the other points from a thing, that we can compose uh, the arrows. And um, as I said on Monday, a key um, idea behind uh, category theory is we don't look into sets or objects or into how functions work on elements, but we just care about the compositional structure between them, the compositional structure of how arrows compose. Um, so, uh, um, a formally, a category uh, consists of a set of objects and a set of arrows, uh, such that for each um, object there is an identity map uh, to itself, um, and uh, that whenever we have two arrows, so for one from A uh, to B and one from B to C, that we get an arrow from A to C, that is the composition thereof. And then we have two key assumptions, one is uh, that every uh, object has identity map that uh, satisfies an identity law and that we have an associativity law that it doesn't matter in which order we contract, the composition is the same. 
And uh, key examples of categories that we already discussed on Monday uh, would be things like sets, where the objects are sets and the uh, morphisms are um, uh, functions between sets. Uh, the category of vector spaces, where the objects are vector spaces and the arrows are linear maps. Topological sp the category of topological spaces of topological spaces and continuous maps. And the category of groups, whose objects are groups and um, uh, morphisms are group um, homomorphisms. Um, but not only uh, can we talk about categories of mathematical objects, we can also see some uh, things that we already care about as a category. And uh, examples I'll show are groups and uh, pre-orders. And uh, then there's a whole realm of applied category theory that also um, models things like probability distributions um, that can be used to model causality, uh, chemical reactions, things like that. Um, so the example we saw um, on Monday, we'll do again. Those are um, uh, pre-orders as a category. Um, so uh, this is an example of a cat of a mathematical structure that we reinterpret as a category with certain um, extra axioms. So in cl classically, a pre-order uh, defines a set of things and a potential relationship between the things. And we require that this um, uh, relationship is reflective um, and the relationship is a smaller than or equal relationship. And we require that this is reflexive and transitive. Uh, examples you could think of are reachability in graphs, uh, the, the natural numbers with their orderings, uh, subsets, and inclusion relationships. Uh, we can also think of a pre-order as a category, and in the category, and, and in that way, a pre-order is exactly a category um, if we say that between any two objects there is at most uh, one morphism. So there can be zero. Um, uh, morphisms between them if an object A and an object B do not satisfy a, a smaller than relationship or there is a unique way in which A is smaller than B. Um, and um, due to the reflexivity of um, pre-orders, uh, we have an identity arrow. Um, and um, because we have transitivity, um, if we have an arrow from A to B, meaning A is smaller than B, and we have uh, B is smaller than C, so arrow from B to C, we have a way to get from A to C due to the transitivity of the relationship. Um, and uh, because we have a uni unique morphism between any, uh, at most one morphism, uh, this relationship is always associative, so this makes it a category. And also the other way around, so a pre-order is a category, and a category in which there is at most one arrow is also equivalently a pre-order. We can also think of groups as categories. And uh, to do that, we will first define an isomorphism. An isomorphism is an arrow. Um, so an arrow um, F from A to B is isomorphic. If there exists an arrow from B to A, that, that that gives us the identity. So if we go from um, A to B with F and then from B to A with G, we get the identity on A. Or if we go from uh, B to A with G and then from B to A with F, we get the identity. Then F is an isomorphism and G is called its inverse. Um, if we think of groups, then classically we would talk about a group as a set with some associative binary operation, namely the group product, and that we have um, a identity um, uh, element and also an inverse. Um, so every uh, group element has an inverse. And now we can see that we can readily interpret the group as a category by just saying a category is a group with only a single object that is often denoted by a star. And um, each morphism, um, goes from the star to the star, and each morphism corresponds with a group element. Um, and um, we require that this is an isomorphism. Um, so uh, the uh, composition of group elements is now just simply the composition of morphisms. So you can th think of this category as one object with uh, the ar every arrow corresponding to a group element, and um, the composition of arrows is exactly the composition of group elements. Um, the uh, identity um, 
the um, identity element in the group um, is exactly the identity morphism from the star to itself. And um, because a group operation is associative, um, the same holds uh, for the group elements interpreted as morphisms in the category. So we see that any group is a category or and also any category with a single object in which each morphism is an isomorphism is equivalent to a group. So here we see that the groups have a very nice interpretation in terms of categories. So now let's relax one of these assumptions. Um, a groupoid is a category where every morphism is an isomorphism, but we don't require that there's only a single um, object in the group. Uh, a key um, example that we'll uh, see later in this talk is the category of graphs, where every object is a graph and every isomorphism reflects a graph isomorphism between the graphs. Um, notable, notably, um, a group um, uh, in a groupoid, uh, it sometimes makes sense to think of two different kinds of morphisms. Uh, one is the automorphisms that map from an object to itself. So for example, this object X has um, uh, three morphisms to itself. Um, and the isomorphisms between objects, which are, for example, the isomorphisms that go from X uh, to Y. Uh, it's easy to see that if we restrict our group by to just the automorphisms, then we get a group. This is called the automorphism group because now we have just only a thing. Now we have still isomorphisms, but we only have a single object. So that gives us from a group by the group. Uh, furthermore, another thing that's useful that we're going to use are the isomorphism classes. And that is simply a partition of the groupoid in the connected components. So in this case, we would have an isomorphism class that contains X and Y because they're isomorphic to each other because an arrow exists between them. Uh, and then the other um, is um, isomorphism class contains just the object Z. Any questions so far? So we, um, yeah, groupoids are simply groups with more than one object. So now let's look at group actions that uh, we talked about on Monday, and Maurice also talked about. Oh, I need one to map from X to Y. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, in, in order for everything to an isomorphism, a consequence of that would be that um, every um, object. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, yeah. So a, a consequence of the definition would be that every object in the isomorphism class would have an automorphism group that is isomorphic to each other. Uh, and also that between any two objects in the isomorphism class, you have as many arrows as there are elements in the automorphism group. So it's not a coincidence that this is three, this is three, this is three, and this is three. Yeah. Um, and that also makes sense, right? Because in a way, X and Y are the, are the sim like equivalent views on the same object, so we want the symmetry properties to be the same. Um, so a group action um, on a group uh, of a group X, a G on the set X um, is a um, means that for every element of the group we have a set bijection uh, we call F of G, and we require that this respects the group um, multiplication so that if we uh, act uh, with um, the uh, group on composition of G and G, G prime, that this is the same as acting first with G prime and then acting with G. Um, if this group action is linear uh, and the set X is a vector space, we call this a group representation that we've seen uh, throughout uh, all the many of the talks this week already. Um, we, now we generalize this so that we can uh, talk not only about um, group actions from groups, but uh, maps between arbitrary categories, and that is called a functor. A functor between two categories does the following. It maps, so 
a functor from a category C to a category D um, is firstly a map on the objects. So for every object in C, it gives us an object in the category D. Um, furthermore, whenever we have a morphism um, from A to B in the category C, we get a morphism um, from F of A to F of B, which is a morphism in the category D. And then we require again that a composition is preserved so that if we uh, map um, the, so the, um, so that um, the um, functor, maybe I should draw this. So we have a function f from a map f from a to b and a map g from b to c. And this is mapped by the functor to Um, so in the category C, we have a function f from A to B and G to, from B to C. Um, is this maybe turned off? Um, now in the category D, which uh, our functor f maps to, uh, we get a, func uh, a function f of f from f of A to f of B and a function f of G from B from f of B to f of C. Additionally, we require that if we compose these um, two maps, that this is equal to the functor of the composition of this map in this category. So this is um, just exactly the same as the uh, group homomorphism property uh, that we saw here uh, for group actions. Uh, we now have this in a more general form for arbitrary uh, for functors. And um, um, a couple of examples of functors. Um, so if we have a functor between groups uh, interpreted as categories, this is equivalent to a group homomorphism. Um, if we have a, a functor between uh, pre-orders, this would constitute a monotone map that preserves order. Um, a group action that we see here before is a, um, a functor from the group interpreted as a category to set that maps the um, unique object in uh, the category G to the set that we act on and maps every morphism from star to star uh, to a, a map from the set to itself. So this is exactly equivalent to the group action as we saw it above. Similarly, uh, a group representation is a functor from G as a category to the category of vector spaces. So we map the unique object in G to a vector space and each arrow in G to a linear map. Are there any questions on this? Um, is there some equivalent of a uh, phase product uh, of a group action? From uh, there are, yeah, there, that's called faithfulness. Um, in categories, um, um, a functor is faithful when um, the map uh, so if we have, um, we look at the set of um, maps from A to B, um, and the set of maps is mapped to a set of maps from F of A to F of B. Um, if the function of morphism, so that's a map from set of functions to a set of functions. If that is um, an injective function, then uh, the functor is called faithful. And I think that's equivalent to saying that uh, the group representation is faithful because in a way that's like an injective, because that's an injective group representation is a faithful one, right? So I think then these, that's a, uh, yeah, th these things go inside. Thanks. So uh, as we've seen a lot uh, this week, an equivariant map, um, from a, a group representation V 
uh, with a uh, representation uh, row uh, to a representation row prime uh, is a linear map from V to V prime uh, such that if we uh, first act with um, the um, representation for any group element and then with the linear map that this is the same as first acting with the linear map and then with the group representation. Um, so so um, group representations we generalize to functors. So now we're also going to think about a map between two functors and that is called a natural transformation. So a natural transformation between two functors rho and rho prime. Um, and we write that as um, a double arrow. Turn this on. Um, that's the following. So for each object of a category, um, we get a map uh, from row of A, which is an element, which is an object in D, uh, to row prime of A, again an object in D. So this is a morphism in D, uh, such that for each arrow in C, uh, we get a similar commutation, meaning the following in diagrams. So in diagrams, um, a group equivariance means that uh, we map um, a function f from v to v prime and then act with the group representation is the same as first acting with the group representation and then with the function f. Now we generalize that to saying that for every object for every object a uh, we have this kind of map from row of a to row prime of a and for any morphism from a to b we get a commuting diagram so that if we first go with this map at a and then act with our morphism that this is the same as first acting uh, with this morphism and then with eta b um, we can see that um, um, in the case where the group the category c is a group and rho is a um, group representation then that the natural transformation reduces to a group representation sorry, that the natural transformation reduces to equivariance um, because the group had only a single object, star, and a row of star um, is uh, the vector space. So then we have here the vector space and here the primed vector space. So then here we have the linear map, which is exactly what we had here on the top. And um, every morphism is just from star to star. So in the bottom, we also get a V and um, because we only had a single object here, we also get a map from V, to, the same map from V to V. So there we see that the natural transformation reduces to a equivariant map. Are there questions on this? So um, that's all um, kind of the base, basic definitions and um, now I'd like to tell you a bit about how we use these things to um, build um, neural networks that work on graphs in collaboration with uh, Taco Cohen and uh, Max Welling. So um, as probably a lot of you know that if we um, build, if we represent a graph in our computer, what we generally do is we assign uh, integers to um, all the nodes. And uh, we we need to do that to uh, to represent it, but still there may be very there may be different ways of representing the same graph, namely by permuting uh, the indices. So, um, so, um, and and whenever these um, graphs are related by by such a relabeling of the nodes, we want our neural network to work in the same way on that, and. Um, um, so mathematically, we can think of graphs as a groupoid, namely the groupoid uh, whose um, isomorphisms are graph isomorphisms. So the object would contain adjacency matrices like this, and the isomorphisms would uh, mean uh, graph isomorphisms between them. And a graph isomorphism is a relate is a map between vertices such that the edge structure is preserved. In particular, we can have automorphisms. Uh, which are isomorphisms to themselves. So for this graph, um, we could swap the second and the fourth node, and the graph would be the same. So this is a permutation of the, this is a map between the nodes, 
uh, such that the adjacency structure actually is the same. And that's why this is an automorphism of the graph. So the group weight of graphs contains graphs and iso isomorphisms between them. Um, so um, now if we want to do neural networks with graphs, we need to make features out of graphs, um, ideally linear features so that we can have neural networks operate on them. Um, and um, a graph feature, um, one graph feature is to just assign a single scalar number to the graph. Um, and and um, a key property of a graph feature is that we know how the graph feature transforms under such a graph isomorphism or permutation of nodes. So, um, for example, one of the things we can do is assign uh, one real number to each node in the graph. Uh, or another thing we can do is assign um, a matrix to each graph corresponding to the adjacency matrix. And what's key here is that we also encode how um, this feature transforms if we were to permute the nodes. Um, in the vector case, we just permute the vector. In the matrix case, we would permute the rows and the columns of the vector. So this gives um, equivariant graph networks that we've seen, and there's many instantiations of this idea. Um, um, so what um, a, um, um, how that would work is uh, we build some neural network, and the neural network takes as input some information about the graph, namely the adjacency matrix. It also takes features on the graph and outputs new features on the graph. And um, equivariance of this um, a network uh, means that if we permute on the input both the adjacency matrix and the input features, then apply the network, that this is equivalent uh, to uh, first applying the network and then permuting the output uh, by the permutation. Um, if, we, um, if the features that we use here are uh, vectors, as we saw here, this is equivalent to a, uh, a deep set. Sorry, if we, yes. Um, and if we use, um, and this is one parameter, if we uh, use, um, sorry, if we use uh, scalars for the graph, we have only one parameter. If we use vectors for the graph, we have two parameters. And if we use matrices for the graph, you have 15 parameters. Um, and that's not a lot of parameters, if we think in the linear regime. So um, let's see if we can do better than that. So for the natural graph network, we, um, which is um, how we're uh, doing this by, uh, which is what we're gonna do. We're gonna um, look not as at the group of permutations, but we look at this as a groupoid of graphs. So we start with the groupoid of graphs as a set containing graphs and isomorphisms between them and then define a groupoid representation, um, which assigns for each graph uh, a linear space, and uh, for each isomorphism, um, a linear transformation between the spaces. Um, an example that we can take in our, in our heads is, for example, the vector feature, which assigns uh, for each node in the graph a real number, and for each isomorphism, uh, that we permute this number appropriately. Now, a natural transformation uh, between two such features contains uh, for each graph a potentially different um, uh, a linear transformation or nonlinear transformation between these features. And this is a dramatic difference uh, uh, between what we saw before. Here we allow potentially every different graph to have completely separate parameters rather than use a single net network for every graph. But there are some constraints, and the constraints are the following. Um, so if we have um, uh, our neural network working on a graph G, and we have, a, we have another graph G that is not isomorphic, then the weights are completely separate between the networks. And this, is, this makes sense. Whenever two graphs are uh, fundamentally different and there's no symmetry between them, then we have no reason to share weights 
on the networks uh, that process them. However, if we have um, another graph T prime that is isomorphic to the first one, then uh, what we want is we want um, this diagram to hold, meaning that if we um, apply our network on the graph G and then map with an isomorphism to the isomorphic graph T prime, then we get the same result as first mapping to the isomorphic graph and then applying our neural network uh, T prime on T prime. So we see that whenever graphs are isomorphic, we have a, a connection here between the neural networks that operate on them. Um, and because this is a bijection, um, this also means that um, the neural network on G prime is completely fixed once we fix the network on G. So what, is, what does this mean? That means that for every isomorphism class of graphs, we can freely pick a network, but then for every isomorphic graph that is isomorphic to the first, our network is completely fixed in terms of the first one. So in a way, for every isomorphism class, we freely can pick a network, um, and um, between the class, we must share weights. But if we have automorphisms, namely maps from the graph to itself, symmetries of the graph, we have a constraint on how the network must operate. Namely, for the particular graph of, uh, for the particular graph G, the network should be the same uh, if we apply the network and then the automorphism, or first the automorphism and then the network. So, in other words, um, the network should be equivariant, but now it should be equivariant to not to any permutation, but only to the automorphisms of the graph. So, the symmetries of the graph. Uh, generate constraints on the graph, uh, on the network that operates on that graph. Yes, uh, it's just an uh, automorphism. Uh, it's a map from the graph to itself. Um, so the example uh, is here is, um, here we flip two and four, and we see that uh, and we then can also flip the, uh, in the adjacency matrix, we would flip the second and the fourth row and column. And we see that we get exactly the same adjacency matrix. Sorry? Uh, yes, um, exactly, exactly. So you flip the nodes, but the graph looks the same. Whereas here, um, if we flip, so what we did here is fl uh, like flip the first, second, and fourth, sorry, uh, flip the first and the second, we see that actually this adjacency matrix is a different matrix. So if we do message passing on this graph, then we need to share the weights with the message passing we do in this graph. Um, but the automorphisms give us constraints on the message passing on the particular graph. We're not allowed to do anything. We need to sort of satisfy constraints generated by these automorphisms. But then you have weight sharing uh, over isomorphism classes, and um, this is kind of similar to what we have uh, in case CMMs, right? But um, you you have uh, the automorphisms of your G structure on one transit space, which is your G scalability constraint, and then the uh, isomorphisms is like weight sharing between different transit spaces. But this is something which uh, we just assume, like the sharing between different spaces, where you can derive it. Do you think it fits in this uh, framework or? Uh, I would have to think about it. Um, so, if you want to think of manifolds, maybe we'll. I, think about hmm. I, I don't know. I, 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 maybe we should talk uh, yeah. uh, uh, offline uh, more about it. Yeah, so my, my idea is you have uh, isomorphic tangent spaces at different points. Yes. Um, but then you look at the automorphisms of uh, one tangent space, which gives you uh, constraints. 
the isomorphisms between different transition choices could be worse. Yeah, I think I think that's an instance. Yeah, we can think of um, um, yes. So yeah, you can think of um, yes. We're, we're actually gonna look into something like that later in the talk, where where we look at basically uh, isomorphisms generated by a group acting on a space, and then uh, the automorphisms are exactly like the stabilizers. Uh, so then we get automorphism constraints and uh, weight sharing uh, by sort of transporting with the group. Yeah. How, how does this align with kind of how we understand generalization and these sort of things? Because I have a graph, I have the match to it. Now I use completely different weight and my outputs explode, like compared to the, the, the previous output. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And um, in a way, the. Okay, so. Um, we're going to look at a local version of this story in which all we care about is the isomorphisms of local regions in the graph. And there, um, uh, so then it doesn't matter what happens far away. However, your point still holds in that if we then get an, a certain region that is very weird we've never seen or we add something and change the symmetry, uh, then something what you describe happens. But it happens kind of less often if we only look at local regions of the graph. But I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, yes, so um, let's look at an example of this. So we, here we have uh, the same graph again, and we're going to do um, a, um, uh, and our features, our vector features, our natural transformations linear are uh, these uh, matrices, and um, we um, uh, are constrained by the automorphism of this graph. So here we look only at uh, local message passing on the edge, but we could also just look at this whole matrix and um, look at all 16 parameters. Um, but uh, here we are only, we constrained by the automorphisms, uh, which would uh, cycle uh, these nodes here. And uh, sorry, the automorphism which flip two and four. So um, we have a requirement that if we uh, flip the second and the fourth row and column of this matrix, uh, that it's the same. This is, this is the equivariant constraint on this matrix. And you can see that um, this message passing would have uh, seven parameters if we only do local message passing. So if a graph is asymmetrical, and arguably a lot of graphs are asymmetrical, there are no automorphisms at all. So an equivariant, so a, a, a map that respects the symmetries then is any map whatsoever on this graph because the only constraints are given by the automorphisms of the graph. So here we have uh, one automorphism, and it gives us one constraint on the matrix. If we have an isomorphism uh, to this uh, different isomorphic graph, and note that this, uh, is, uh, um, this has a different adjacency matrix, so it's not an automorphism, but an isomorphism, uh, then we require that uh, the message passing we do sort of the natural graph network on this graph uh, is the same as the first one, uh, up to, but then permuted along the isomorphism. So here we see that this automorphism gives us a constraint on the kinds of matrices that we can use. And uh, whenever we have an isomorphic graph, then we should use the same matrix, um, but uh, uh, permuted along the isomorphism. So that's the takeaway. Automorphisms give us constraints and isomorphisms give us weight sharing. So now to uh, relate the equivariant graph network approach to the natural graph network approach. In the equivariant graph network, they talk, um, they talk about symmetry groups uh, being the permutations uh, of the nodes. Where feature space is a group representation and, um, and the network layers an equivariant map between group representation. And the key thing here is that the same map is used for every graph. In a natural graph network, we uh, don't talk about a symmetry group, but a symmetry groupoid. And uh, the features are, um, um, the feature spaces are given by a functor from this groupoid uh, to um, a vector spaces, and the network layer is a natural transformation. And the key thing here is that we can have a different network potentially for every different graph, as long as we are constrained by the automorphism and share weights by the isomorphisms. So um, as we said, um, we may, um, it, it's, it's weird to think of graphs 
um, to only share graphs when the graphs are exactly to share weights when the graphs are exactly isomorphic. Um, we uh, this may not scale to large graph. It's very complicated. It's very expensive to compute isomorphisms between graphs. Um, so. Um, 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 so we want to avoid that. And also, um, we may get too little weight sharing. It may be that in our test set, we see a graph that we just haven't seen in our train set. And then in this uh, previous formulation, we would have no clue uh, how our network should operate. So we want to do more weight sharing than uh, just, um, we want to do more weight sharing than um, just uh, along uh, globally isomorphic graphs. What we do is we're going local. Uh, we're going to look at not global symmetries, but local symmetries on the graph and share weights when local structures are the same. So how, we, how do we do that? Um, what we're going to do is for each node and each edge, we're going to define a neighborhood. Uh, for example, the one hop neighborhood of nodes and edges. Then instead, then these are groupoids and the, gr and the uh, morphisms in the groupoids are the isomorphisms of these local neighborhoods. Um, let me go to the picture. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, for each uh, node, we're going to define a neighborhood of the node. So for example, this blue neighborhood around the point P. For the neighborhood Q here, we're also going to uh, define a one-hop neighborhood around it, which would contain these four nodes. And similar, uh, similarly for this point P and this point Q. And what we would see is that the neighborhood of Q and the neighborhood of Q prime are th the same graphs. So we say that there is an isomorphism from Q to Q prime. And this is not a global isomorphism because there is uh, no map on the graph that maps Q to Q prime, but the neighborhoods are the same. So we just say that these are isomorphic when their neighborhoods are the same. Similar, there's an isomorphism from P to P prime. But besides looking at nodes, we also look at edges. So to each edge, for example, this edge from P to Q, we also assign it a neighborhood. And then we would see that um, this neighborhood of the edge P to Q is isomorphic to the neighborhood uh, of, uh, uh, from P prime and Q prime. Um, furthermore, we see that also these have automorphisms. Um, namely uh, the ones given by flipping these two nodes. And also the neighborhood of P prime Q prime has an automorphism given by these two nodes. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do message passing constrained by the automorphisms of this edge neighborhood. And whenever two neighborhoods are isomorphic, we're going to do uh, message passing with shared weights. So first we define a node groupoid. Kind of as I said, for each node, uh, we define a neighborhood and a isomorphism between two nodes is an isomorphism of the graph of the graph of their neighborhoods. So this gives us a group out of nodes. And we do the same for edges. For every edge, P to Q, uh, we define a neighborhood. Um, and this gives us an edge group whose object are the edges and whose, uh, whose isomorphisms are isomorphisms of these neighborhoods. Any questions at this stage? Yeah. Yes, and you have quite some flexibility on, on how you define them, but let's for now just look at one hop neighborhoods and all the edges between the nodes. Yes, so uh, this works well when the uh, graph, uh, when the neighborhoods are kind of small. Uh, when uh, you have a fully connected graph, the neighborhood will be the whole graph and then you uh, are in trouble. Thanks. Yeah. So can you say it a bit louder? 
So I, I can't hear you very well. So you, if you have a start topology on the graph, Um, the question is, if you put a star topology on the graph, are these the same as homeomorphisms uh, between between points? Um, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I, uh, in terms of graph theory, it's just a graph isomorphism, but I would assume that the graph isomorphism would translate to a homeomorphism of the thing interpreted as topological spaces, but that would be, uh, I wouldn't know. Um, and we also require a, a correspondence between edges and nodes. So uh, what we want is that for each edge, we want to uh, be able to assign a start node. So we want, for each object in the edge groupoid, we want to um, map to a, st um, to a uh, start um, object in the node groupoid. And similarly, for uh, each isomorphism between edges, we want to have an isomorphism between nodes. So that's what you see here. These uh, edge neighborhood PQ is isomorphic to the uh, edge neighborhood P prime Q prime, and we require that this induces an isomorphism from P to P prime and also from Q to Q prime. Um, and um, this is satisfied if we choose our neighborhoods reasonably. And what is it? What what is this? Well, this gives us a functor, a functor from the category of nodes. Sorry, the category of edges to the category of nodes. Um, and on objects, it maps the edge object to the node object, and it maps the edge isomorphism to a node isomorphism. And the same holds for. So we have two of those: one for the start node and one for the tail node. We call those F0 and F1. Um, so abstractly, we saw that we can generalize uh, group representations to functors from a groupoid to a vector space. So that's what we're going to do to assign um, features to nodes. So we have a group, a functor from the groupoid of nodes to the category of vector spaces. And what does it do? It assigns to each node a feature. And um, it assigns to each uh, isomorphism between nodes, a linear transformation. An example that we could have is, for example, we assign to each node, if it has n neighbors, um, we assign r to the n um, as a feature to the node, and whenever we have a node isomorphism, we just permute this, fa this vector. And this defines a functor from the category of nodes to the category of uh, vector spaces, so a representation of the groupoid. Um, we, we previously defined these um, uh, functors from the edge groupoid to the node groupoid, the, uh, one that maps to the, the edge to the start node, and one that maps the edge to the tail node. So now we have, um, a, um, we have two functors from the edge node to vec, and one from the edge node uh, to VEC. The first one assigns to each edge the feature at its start node, and the second one assigns to each edge the feature at its tail node. And now I say that a message, that our nest natural graph network should be a natural transformation between these functors. So what does that look like? So what does that mean? So we mean that if we have edges, so we have an edge PQ, we have an isomorphic edge P prime Q prime, and maybe a, a non-isomorphic edge from A to B. And then we get a, um, a message passing from the, uh, so for the edge PQ, we get a message passing from the feature at P to the feature at Q. For the, uh, at P prime Q prime, we get a message from the feature at P prime to the feature at Q prime, and similarly for A and B. So here we see that in a normal graph CNN, we would have the same message way of doing message passing for each edge. And here I say that actually we can untie the weights for most of these message passing. We only need to sh have shared weights for the message passing whenever the graphs are isomorphic. 
And uh, that's what we have here. So whenever we have this isomorphism, we get a, a constraint between uh, these, um, uh, we get a constraint between the message passing on PQ and the message passing from uh, between P prime and Q prime. Um, if we have a non-isomorphic edge, we have untied weights. So okay, as we saw in the global version, uh, we need to define a way of doing message passing for each um, uh, isomorphic edge. And for non-isomorphic edges, we are free to choose our kernels. Like before, whenever our edge, whenever our edge has an automorphism, we get a constraint. Um, and uh, in practice, uh, this is a linear constraint that we can solve. And uh, as we saw in the meshes, we can linearly combine uh, those uh, solutions uh, with learnable parameters. And this gives us a learnable uh, linear transformation, which we can use as a building block for a neural network. Um, to uh, actually make a graph neural network, what we will do is do all the message passing along edges and then do some aggregation like summing. To give you an example, so let's uh, look at this node P here and it has a neighborhood. One feature we can assign to uh, this node is just a five dimensional effector uh, reflecting that the neighborhood has five nodes. Um, sorry, I did this figure in the transpose. So we do message passing from P to Q. So we go along this edge and we want to map the feature at P to the feature at Q. The, the node Q has only four neighbors, so we assign it a four dimensional vector space. So the message passing is a matrix that maps five dimensions to four dimensions. And then if we have a message passing along an, isom an isomorphic edge, uh, we need to share weights uh, according to the commuting diagram. So if we do this, we get some nice properties. And uh, just as with the mesh, we had that if you apply a mesh uh, that is actually a, a, a plane, um, and uh, you would apply a mesh uh, gauge equivariant convolution, you would get an, uh, equivariant, uh, 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 an equivariant planar convolution uh, on the planar grid. You actually have the same property here, and I think this is um, the only method for, for which that holds. And in a way, that was kind of the inspiration for this project. So if our graph is a grid, for example, this uh, triangular grid, um, then... Um, Sorry, I made a typo here. Um, then the nodes are just the elements of the grid. So the node category are uh, the um, are the um, grid points. Uh, the automorphisms here are the group of rotations and um, by uh, 60 degrees and the mirror. Sorry, this D4 should be a D6. And the representations are equivalent to a uh, D6 representation. So everywhere I, I, I went from a square grid to this grid. So everything where you see a four, you should read a um, six. So um, the node representation is equivalent to a representation of this group of the, of the grid. And um, the edge automorphisms for this grid are exactly uh, given by uh, flipping the edge uh, from top to bottom. So that is just a mirror symmetry. Um, and you can see that um, these kind of features and message passing that is constrained in this way is exactly what you would get if you would normally define a CNN on a grid like this. Um, so we see that here, even though we make no assumption about like uh, where the grid points are in space, because there is no space, just from the topology, the topology of the graph, we get a, um, a message passing that is equivalent to a CNN uh, had we defined it in the uh, equivariantly uh, conventionally on the grid. What would you see something like a non-rotation equivariant uh, CNN? Perhaps something which would trigger a good structure. Uh, do, do you see structure you could add on your grid uh, to break your automorphism? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, if we have a canonical notion of up, uh, how, what, what could we do? Or like maybe like an orientation, what can we do to our graph? Uh, to kind of break the symmetry. Um, interesting question. I mean, in theory, you could, I don't know, say that 
uh, these graphs, like if you want to break the mirror symmetry, that there's some orientation to cycles in the graph or something like that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I, I'm not really sure. You can do something, but I'm not really sure what kind of the natural thing to do is. Um, so here we see that just from the topology of the graph, we can uh, recover the equivariance networks that we like, that I like. <laughs> What is an oriented graph? If you're reacting, you have to get a up and down. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, if you if you do some, yes, yeah, I see that. Yeah, um, that's that's a, a sensible way of doing this. Yeah, if you just label some, if you make some choices about direction, you can encode these kind of things. Yeah, this makes sense. So yeah, this is equivalent to a GCNN uh, on uh, on uh, this hexagonal grid. Um, also, um, it is equivalent to the manifold CNN that we've saw, seen before. So, in a particular case, uh, so in the paper, um, in the paper where Maurice worked on, uh, they they looked at the icosahedron and put a grid on the icosahedron. Um, now, um, um, uh, there they defined the gate equivariant convolution on this uh, uh, on this space. And uh, you can see that um, by a very similar argument, uh, the message passing that we do in the natural graph network is equivalent to the gates equivariant convolution that they did on the graph. Uh, the only differences are the corners, uh, but um, Maurice also told me that in their implementation, they set those message passing to zero, so we can uh, forget about the corners uh, if we want. So uh, the basic algorithm for kind of the simple version is um, we define uh, nodes and edge neighborhoods, we classify these edge neighborhoods in isomorphism classes, and we compute the automorphisms uh, of the neighborhoods. Um, this gives us constraints and that we solve. Um, then uh, during uh, inference or training, we linearly combine uh, the solutions with the parameters, um, and we uh, do that once for each isomorphism class and transport the kernel to the different edges in the class and uh, that allows us to compute the, comp the convolution. Uh, this is uh, very fast. If our uh, edges are, if our edge neighborhoods are small and there's a small number of, uh, a small number of classes of them, because in a way we still do message passing, but if the edge neighborhoods grow, it becomes very expensive to compute uh, the automorphisms of, um, uh, the automorphisms of the, uh, of the graph neighborhood. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, um, the complexity of doing any graph isomorphism test is like super exponential. Uh, so you would have that problem here also. Yeah. Yes. You actually don't know how, how bad that can be. Oh, no. Like it can be really, really bad. It can be really, really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So connection to sheaves. I added this slide yesterday after being inspired by, uh, by Chris's talk on sheaves. So, it is a question mark. Um, you can tell me where I'm wrong. Um, so I think what we can think of this as, um, um, I think we can think of this procedure as a sheaf, where we assign to each node a graph feature of uh, the neighborhood. So this gives us a vector space at each graph. And uh, for each edge, we also assign the vector space. And then the uh, projection map, I'm not sure if I wrote this in the right direction, is a map from um, the edge vector space to the node vector space. Uh, so, um, yeah, we, and, and one, one thing we can do is, for example, for each node, as I said, we uh, look at the neighborhood and then uh, give, get one dimension for each node in the neighborhood. And similarly, for the edge, we, define, we give uh, this a feature space where we get one dimension for each node in the edge neighborhood. And uh, the projection here, from the feature here to here, it's just a uh, projection that uh, ignores all the nodes that are not in the edge neighborhood. Now, if we um, uh, um, look at this uh, graph feature of this node PQ and, uh, and, and build a network that transforms such, such features, then we can think of our message passing in the following way. 
and I, I think this looks a lot like what we've seen on Sheaves, in the sense that we um, map from a node feature to the edge feature by the transpose of the uh, uh, restriction map. Then we would apply our, our graph network. Um, I'm not sure this was in Chris's talk, so maybe we take this the identity then. <laughs> and uh, then we project back from the edge neighborhood uh, to the uh, uh, tail neighborhood Q. So we map from a feature P to we embed that in the edge uh, feature, so which is a feature on this graph. Then we do some graph network on this graph. And then we restrict to the neighborhood of Q. Um, and then uh, we get a, um, um, uh, a, a message passing. If we compose all of this, we get a message from the feature at P to the feature at Q uh, in this way. Um, and now I haven't proven this, but I'm quite sure that this is true, that if we think of this um, um, graph network as being a natural transformation of the graph symmetries of these edge neighborhoods, uh, then um, the induced map here is a natural message passing map. So here we can, uh, um, so we, uh, so here we kind of reduce our local procedure in terms of a uh, graph network that operates on the graph of the neighborhood P and Q. So in a way we have a two level thing here in that to build our graph network, we have a equivariant graph network that operates on uh, the neighborhood of the edge. So there are some challenges. So in, in, in any, uh, so even if we have very small edge neighborhoods, we still get many, many um, isomorphism classes between edges. So many, many different parameters that we need to work with. And even worse, it may be that in our test set, there are some edges that are that don't occur in our training set, and then we don't know what to do with them. So uh, an obvious question is how can we now again find a common parameterization for these um, graph networks that operate on uh, the edge neighborhoods uh, that we can generalize uh, for edges that we haven't seen before. Um, so one thing we could do is uh, we could treat only some edges that are very common in our data as like non-trivial and reduced to a conventional message passing on uh, uh, on most other edges. So we kind of have a small library of things where we are special and otherwise we re restrict to the normal thing. Um, we can try to find like a, a shared parameterization. Um, let me skip that for now. Um, but what we did in practice um, is we use a graph neural network um, as, um, as this uh, network that acts on the neighborhood of the edges. And um, then we use a very simple, like a, a graph CNN that operates on uh, uh, this graph neighborhoods. So this, this gives us a two layer approach. We built our, uh, on every edge, we, do, we apply a graph neural network uh, on these neighborhoods. And um, this gives us uh, the natural graph network that we wanted in a very specific um, uh, parameterization. A very elegant approach that was um, um, written about by Tide et al. in uh, 2021 called Autobahn Networks, I, I find very uh, uh, elegant. They look only at, um, they kind of make non-trivial any, um, uh, any edge wh when there is like a nice symmetry group. So for example, they look at chains and then think of the symmetry group as uh, like translations on the chain. Or they look at cycles and they think of the symmetry group as rotations along the cycle. So they kind of, they do something very similar to here, but then they restrict themselves to classes of edges that have an elegant symmetry uh, group and uh, then be equivariant to that particular symmetry group. And um, this is uh, very sensible and maybe in molecular graphs where uh, chains and cycles are very common features. So in summary, um, I have 20 minutes. Um, in, in summary, uh, graph networks, um, they um, need to treat all isomorphic graphs equivalently, um, but graph symmetries are actually, uh, we, we are restricted not by all permutations of nodes, but by all automorphisms of the graph. 
So what we do is we um, make a network layer that is uh, a natural transformation between functors. In the global version of our story, uh, we look at natural transformations between graph symmetries. And in our local message passing story, we look at uh, natural transformations between uh, symmetries of the edges. And uh, by um, only looking at the edges, we get better weight sharing and uh, um, a slightly more tractable computation. So um, any questions on this story? Of course. So in the sense that um, we gain expressivity in this uh, process, um, at least if you think of linear layers, yeah. um, then um, uh, message passing between, yeah, uh, on graphs without symmetries are, is unconstrained. And that is a feature that, um, doesn't show up if you think of uh, message pass, a linear message, a linear equivariant map between feet, between representations of the permutation group. I, I, I like this. I like this approach. I kind of thought that it's, uh, it's almost like a price to pay. As, yes. As in like, as, you know, we know this being worked by a guy around, but also like uh, there was this fancy work by, I think it was Trayvon and Dre. I'm not sure about the first book, but I think it was Trayvon that where they showed us you can have like linear layers and then I guess some equivalent way of you know, linearity and you are like basically universal approximators, which is like basically as good as you want to be. But you pay a price in the order of answers that you need. And I think there is no output down there. There might be some explanation. Uh, is that the invariant expressivity with Maron also on there, right? Yeah, but there's, there's like another paper where they sort of basically like have this dual point of view where they show, they show universality. Yes. And they pay a price there. Which yeah. Is the, the ramp depends. But I feel like here you it's sort of like shifted in the price that we pay in the computation of the low bottom of this right? Yeah. So I was wondering like if, if there's some actual thing we know, like precise statement in terms of power of the job. No, it is more powerful than one Rice Fighter Lehman. Okay. <laughs> and that's a very weak statement. <laughs> Every time I hear WSS, my brain's like, but I, I, I can't. I, that, I, 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 I don't know. Investigate yes. Explain a different point. I wonder. Yeah. 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 That's a, yeah. In a way, it is a bit cheating if you think of like, uh, if, if your test is to do graph isomorphism, yeah. then we need to pre compute isomorphisms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you need to think of a. Yeah. Ethical, but in practice, you know, it's 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 different. Like as you said, it's almost like about investigating how close you are, right? Like in some metric uh, topology, that's more interesting than one part of the practice. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's that's worth, I guess. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting question. I I'm not sure I have the tools to uh, to find some uh, nice answer to it, but. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I have to just... Yes. You know, you mentioned about other people. Very specific yes. Yeah. 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 And that's also what we see in a bit that we forget about graphs and we look at Euclidean spaces. Uh, there, isomorphisms become something else entirely. And uh, so I think you're allowed to say nodes are isomorphic when they're in chains of length 20 or something like that. Okay, so now we're going to try to uh, apply these ideas to points in Euclidean space. Oh, yes. Chris. So Stream of work which I think showed up a year maybe after your paper on top graph, graph neural network. Or yes. Something. Yeah, and these have been quite successful. So like this, just, like this counting paper that I think Michael was. Yeah. So just that by literally like running a GNN on that neighbor code essentially. Ah. So okay. Essentially, not just looking at the star graph, but actually sort of the the whole subgraph, which is uh, at the central node, and 
So first of all, actually, I'm not sure if this paper, I think your framework when I was reading the paper really generalizes these approaches because essentially what they're doing, they just do what the category theory says you should not do, which is do avoid sharing completely. So just like a regular GNN. So my question is, do you think if you actually took like a less category theory approach, you know, would have kind of obtained something like that, that, you know, just fully shares everything and maybe run a GNN on that? Yeah, well, I mean, a way that that is kind of what I proposed. It's very, I mean, that sounds very. I, I don't know the the details of. Uh, I don't know the details of 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 what they do now, but I, I that it that sounds quite similar to what I what we think of here. As we uh, do on each edge, we just uh, do some graph neural network on the neighborhood. Uh, but I, we have to look into the. Yeah, I don't know the specifics. Watch. Differences are because this method seems to work much better. So might be just some yeah. maybe implementation sort of details, or uh, and I think these are I'm not sure if they are where your your work. So if I want to email this folks. Okay. Yeah. Maybe maybe I should. Also, I I must say a, good, a big caveat is these things don't work fantastically compared. To, I mean, there are there are better things if you actually care about graph processing. But um, yeah. Uh, okay. I should look into that. Thank you. So I have not so much time, I think. No, okay. So um, let's try to see how we can uh, talk about uh, kind of the same framework, but then the Euclidean spaces. So we have this uh, general, uh, we can think of this as a, now, forget about graphs, we think of this very abstractly. We think of a category of uh, edges and isomorphisms between edges, so groupoid. We think of uh, a, a groupoid of nodes and uh, isomorphisms between nodes. We think of a way of mapping from edges to nodes in the start and the tail of the message. We assign a, a groupoid representation to nodes, and uh, what we build is a natural transformation uh, between these two composed functors. So we first we th thought of this in the context of graphs, and now we're gonna um, uh, yes, and now we're gonna think of this in Euclidean spaces. So what does this uh, a message passing do? Well, for any edge. It uh, gives us a, a map from the uh, input feature to the output feature, satisfying uh, such commu commuting diagrams that are transporting with an isomorphism, then applying uh, the message passing is the same as first the message passing and then the isomorphism. So now we're going to apply this to Euclidean spaces. So point clouds um, are um, oh, uh, point clouds are uh, so a set of endpoints. In, uh, in three dimensional space. So, here I just talk about three dimensions for now. Um, so, we get data of uh, n times three dimensional matrices, and we want to have a neural network operating, uh, acting on these. And what we require is that if um, um, that we are equivariant with respect to global transformations of space. So, that if we translate, um, if we translate the input space or uh, permute the nodes or apply a rotation to the space, um, that then we get an equivariance relationship uh, by this network because we assume that we don't know a canonical pose of our point cloud. And a, a, a key example would be maybe we have a molecule, we know where the atoms are, but of course molecules don't have a canonical orientation. So we want to be equivariant with respect to uh, uh, changes of pose of this molecule when presented to our network. And maybe another example is we have a car driving around in the world and we want to analyze the world, but the car can uh, be driving in different directions and thus the data that it gets um, may be rotated with relative to other data it's seen previously. Uh, so we may want to be equivariant with respect to such transformations. Um, when people build uh, networks that are equivariant to such things, generally what they do is they, um, look not at absolute points but at differences between points and through that obtain equivariance with respect to translation and they do something like a message passing network that makes them equivariant with respect to permutation so the interesting part is in the symmetry of rotations um, Yes, so uh, what they built is um, these rotations. Uh, to deal with the rotations, they give every node a feature and they tell the feature how it transforms under a rotation. So they pick a representation of the group SO3 of 3D rotations, uh, an input and an output representation. 
And the examples are a scalar, so every node gets a scalar, uh, and that will be an invariant. Uh, it could get, every node could get a three vector that rotates uh, like a three dimensional vector or a matrix thereof. Um, and there's uh, all kinds of representations that you can choose. And then they one would build a message network that takes in uh, relative uh, coordinates and an input feature, and the network would output an output feature, which you would aggregate uh, into uh, a new feature at a node. So you sum over neighbors, or you sum over points that are close by, you fill in the relative coordinates in the network, um, and an input feature in the network gives you an output feature, you aggregate that, and that is your new feature at a point. Um, SO3 equivariance uh, gives us then an equation that you that may now look familiar to you, so that if you uh, rotate um, the input coordinates and uh, the input feature that this, and then apply the network, that this is the same as applying the network and then rotating the output. And um, there are people who do this successfully in practice, and I should add citations here. I will do that um, in um, the um, um, uh, slides as, uh, when they're uploaded, um, but uh, there are some tricky parts about uh, SO3. Um, one part is that the representations are all in varying dimensions. Uh, the Klebs Gordon coefficients that relate uh, different representations, um, they um, are not as nice as for SO2, the two dimensional rotations. Um, and as addition, so these are quite practical considerations. Um, and um, furthermore, this network is conditional on the direction, uh, the difference factor from the nodes B and Q. Please. Um, what is the PI of your edges now and your edge are more? These are relative vectors? Or? Next slide. What do you mean by varying dimensions? In that uh, the ir irreducible representations, they have uh, varying dimensions. So what I propose is to do the following. Um, so we think of our node groupoid as containing as objects just the points in R3. And the isomorphisms are, uh, between a point P and a point P prime are a group element of the symmetry group, an element of the symmetry group that maps the point P to the point P prime. So um, we, uh, we write that as G sub P, which maps uh, so that's a group element start, starting at a point P and mapping to a point P prime. Uh, this is sometimes called the action groupoid of the group uh, SE3 acting on the space R3. And in this case, we would have that all points are isomorphic because the group acts transitively. There's always a symmetry that maps um, any point to any point. So there is only one class of isomorphism, one isomorphism class in the node, node groupoid. The edge groupoid is similar. We look at pairs of points and actions of SE3 on that. So the objects are pairs of points in R3, so edges, and the isomorphisms are group elements that map both the start and the tail uh, node, uh, node of the edge uh, to each other. So we would have an edge P and Q and an, um, um, and uh, an edge P prime Q prime, and then an isomorphism is an element of the group that maps P to P prime and Q to Q prime. And then you would have uh, in uh, a Euclidean space that edges of the same length are isomorphic. Um, we would also assign uh, features to the nodes, and these would just be SO3 representations. And um, the, uh, under isomorphisms, they just uh, transform according to the group representation. Now, if we do natural message passing uh, between, uh, so this is all we need to define natural message passing. And now the question is, what do we get out of it? And what we get out of it is the following. So um, the automorphisms of an edge are the rotations. Um, so for example, if we look at this edge, let's call this the canonical edge of length R, it goes from zero to the point uh, R, comma zero zero on the x-axis. The automorphisms of this edge are um, the rotations around this axis because 
if we have this axis, then the rotations that go like this keep the keep the axis keep the edge uh, on itself. Um, so if so, that's what we'll now do. We if we do message passing from P to Q, sorry, and we have this isomorphism between them. So what we do is we compute one of the group elements that maps this edge to this edge, um, and then to do a message passing from P to Q. What we do is we transform, uh, we map from the point P to the point zero with the isomorphism um, that we found G. And then we do message passing along the zero direction. And then we pass our message back to Q. And this is just given by the naturality diagram because these edges are isomorphic, they share weights. So what we can do is just walk the diagram, uh, go from P to zero on the canonical edge, do message passing on the canonical edge, and then go back from the x-axis to the point Q. Um, and we know that this must be constrained by the automorphisms of the edge, and the automorphisms here are the group, the, sub, the, the set of rotations uh, that preserves this edge, and this is actually a planar rotation group. So this is the key point. We, we first we had to build our network that was equivariant to rotations in three dimensions, and now we reduce it to two dimensions because all we need all we need to build is an uh, a network that is equivariant to SO2 transformations. So um, these um, um, so this is what we do. We um, so for each edge we pre-compute a group element that maps P to zero and Q to the x-axis. Then we construct a uh, SO2 equivariant uh, network that processes features. Uh, and this is conditional only on the distance. So we no longer need to make our network conditional on direction. We only make our network conditional on the radius uh, that maps between uh, the features. And then uh, what we do to process a message from P to Q uh, we move the feature from P to zero with the group action G. We do equivariant message passing with our SO2 equivariant network. And then we move back the feature from the x-axis to the point Q with the inverse of the group transformation. And then we sum over incoming messages. So um, here we use SO2 equivariance to construct an SO3 equivariant um, neural network. And um, this is um, uh, simpler to construct. Um, and but what is particularly nice, I think, is that there are more available nonlinearities. Because in my previous talk, I talked about how we can construct SO2 equivariant nonlinearities by doing a sampling on the circle. But if we want to do a sampling um, on SO3, that's a three-dimensional space for which uh, gridding is much more complicated than just a sampling on the circle. Um, so that's why those kinds of nonlinearities for SO2 are much easier to construct than nonlinearities for SO3. Um, so that's what we did. We uh, used these insights to reduce a three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional uh, problem of equivariance. We can do something similar. Uh, so that is um, the point cloud uh, interpretation of this. And this is a work in progress, and I don't really have many results yet. but. Um, 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 I hope it's interesting to you. Um, are there any questions about point clouds and the Euclidean story? Okay, so then um, we um, can also look to go from 2D to 1D. So um, if you think of 2D, so let's think of this now in 2D, uh, we can again map any such edge to the canonical edge. Because now this canonical edge has no automorphism, so there are no constraints to do the message passing uh, from zero uh, to this point. So we can do unconstrained message passing. Um, and what does it mean? Well, we can even use like nonlinear value networks uh, to do our message passing here um, because uh, there's no constraints. We have kind of broken the symmetry because we looked along the edge. So we, can, we, we don't, we, in the 2D case, we no longer have to do any kinds of special nonlinearity. Um, 
if we do it in the message pass, we can just use normal MLPs with values um, and still be equivariant. And we can also use this for uh, the gate equivariant machine, and then we got some uh, interesting results with that. So here you can have a very simple nonlinearity that is exactly equivariant, different from the approximate equivariance that I mentioned earlier, uh, just using ReLU nonlinearities. So in conclusion to the story, um, we have generalized groups to groupoids and equivariance to natural transformations. And it gave us a nice message passing on graphs where we do weight sharing along edges only if the edges are isomorphic. And we got constraints on the weight pass on the message passing whenever we had uh, symmetries of the edges. Uh, we can also apply these ideas to point clouds and reduce the 3D symmetry to a 2D symmetry. And, um, and if you apply it in the planar case, we can reduce a 2D symmetry to a trivial symmetry and use unconstrained neural networks. And these are just a couple of implementations or instantiations, I feel, of this kind of thinking. And uh, I would encourage you all to, uh, to come up with uh, even uh, uh, of, uh, more interesting and exotic uh, um, versions hereof. Um, and an open question here is we talked about global symmetries and local symmetries. And um, what you would like is the, uh, sort of an elegant formal statement to say that, the that respecting the local symmetries uh, gives you something, and message passing along that gives you something that respects global symmetries. And I have kind of an ugly proof of that, but I'm trying to kind of think more abstractly about it um, uh, to, 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 to give a more insightful argument for that. If anyone has ideas, I'm very open to hear. Um, and then I have some slides on um, uh, causality. And I think I'll skip those because we're out of time. Uh, but it's very interesting. So I'll, I'll just briefly go through them. Uh, so there's some interesting work by a collaborator, Taco Cohen, where we can think of um, uh, models of the world and say that these models have a relationship with the real world if there's a certain natural transformation between the models of the world. I'm just very, very quickly skimming over this. Another thing you can do with category theory is uh, string diagrams. It's a fantastic tool for, from category theory that you can also apply on more uh, concrete things. So in the paper, we had a very long proof with a lot of equations, and then we reduced it to a lot of like diagrammatic arguments like this. And I think everyone, um, and I think that's much prettier. So that's another thing you can use uh, categories for. And um, one of the uh, projects I'm currently working on is to think of causal models in terms of categories. So we may have a causal model saying that we have some genes that cause our smoking behavior and smoking and genes cause whether we may get cancer. We can map that to some category, to a morphism in some category. Um, and uh, when Causal people, they talk about interventions, which means that we do like a randomized control trial and force people to smoke or not smoke. Uh, and we model that as uh, morphisms between morphisms in this category of causal models. So these are all kinds of things you can do with applied category theory. And if you're interested in such things, I recommend having a look at uh, these references. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>